explain to you the structure of the program and we'll move right ahead. When we talk about the Indian in many of these kinds of activities, we are talking possibly about two kinds. We are talking about the people of Indian origin, they're referred to as the PIOs, and sometimes we are talking about the NRIs, non-resident Indians. The PIOs really are foreign citizens of Indian origin, like us, or descent, and the NRIs are non-resident Indians, or Indian citizens living overseas for an indefinite period. We have a number of NRIs here, so Guyana, and perhaps, not perhaps, I'm pretty certain that great parts of the Caribbean also will have both groups of people, the PIOs, people of Indian origin, and the NRI, non-resident Indians. The Indian diaspora obviously will comprise both groups, the PIOs and the NRIs, and they roughly are possibly about 30 million Indians all over the world in about 110 countries. And the diaspora represents about 1.7% of India's population. And only about 3.5 million of the 30 million Indian diasporans are considered economically well settled. The Indian diaspora, folks, is not new. Indians have been abroad back and forth numerous times for hundreds of years. Indians have been settling overseas over the last 2,300 years. Then, commencing in the post buddha period, Indian missionaries traveled to Sri Lanka and Afghanistan. But there has always been a close bond between India and and the Indian diasporans. Uh, last week I mentioned by the Jawaharlal Nehru, whose position was not ambiguous, but he was concerned at that time, and we have to interpret these people's remarks in the context of history at that time. He wasn't keen on interfering with the sovereignty of nations. And so, when there were a lot of complaints made well after the indenture period, he felt that it was better that people who have left India, that they try to make these new countries their new homes and create their little Indians, or recreate their little Indians. And then we saw, I wouldn't say a shift in policy, but more of a different kind of concerns because of new types of development and globalization and so on that came much later. Because in 1977, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who became subsequently Prime Minister of India, had this to say, and I quote, the subject of overseas Indians is one which is very dear to our hearts. Everyone of Indian origin overseas is a representative of India and retains many aspects of our cultural traditions and civilization. Though our sons and daughters have gone abroad to work or to reside there, India will never disown them or fail to appreciate and respect their essential loyalty to the culture and heritage of the mother country. End of quote. This was, pretty, this was said pretty much uh, in, in, in relation to the brutal, the brutal economic globalization that was taking place. And where a lot of this globalization, even today, is working to the disadvantage of poor developing economies. There's another thing I think we need to know finally that I want to point out here. And that is, for many Indians in the Caribbean, there seems to be an ambivalent kind of relationship to India. It's debatable, but certainly, in my mind, and I think Naipaul shares that particular line of thinking. For many Indians in the Caribbean, there's a feeling of ambivalence towards India. Naipaul expressed this ambivalence well when he said in the preface to the Wounded, India a wounded civilization, 
that India is not and cannot be his home. He added, and I quote, I cannot reject it or be indifferent to it. I am at once too close and too far. End of quote, I quote. A dilemma in Indian space in the Caribbean, therefore, is an understanding of his relationship, his relationship with India. And we're not talking about land space here. We're talking about a complex of attitudes, beliefs, norms, and so on, that are part of that complex civilization. So I thought in those few remarks, I, I, I thought they might be a good lead in today's program. But let me first, before I move to the next item, give you a sense of the structure of this program. The next item, we will ask Dr. Anthony to say, to make brief remarks, and then we'll have the introduction of our main speaker, Dr. Kusha Harak Singh from UE. And then you have the plenary session, which will be moderated by Mr. Diaz Sakhar. And then the vote of thanks and so on. I would, I would advise that when we get to the plenary part, the questions and answers, that we really try to make this as strong as last week's session, or even better. Because a lot of comments generally go down very well in terms of adding to the stock of knowledge that we have in this field. So let me now call on the Honorable Dr. Frank Anthony, Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport, Government of Ghana, for a brief response. of one's culture comes from understanding, and understanding comes from education. Both secondary and maybe primary and as well tertiary education need to spend a lot more time in developing cultural curriculum designs that can really present and project this idea of the appreciation of culture of all groups, all groups, because this is a multi-ethnic society. I also want to say as I look at the back here, not only the back of the of, the, of this program, but uh, Dr. Anthony has really made a significant imprint during the, well, he's still there during the stewardship of his position as minister in the cultural ministry. This is uh, amazing, and uh, if you look at the back, these are, the, the back here just has 
a handful, a small sample of what is being done. But we are seeing some major, major developments in the Ministry of Culture Youth and Sport. And I think we need to give the minister a really good round of applause. I now want to ask uh, Mr. Evan Prasad, who is a lecturer at the, in, Ge in Geological Engineering at the University of Guyana, to present and introduce Dr. Kusha Haraksin. Thank you. Thank you. 
the movements that I have in mind are the mingling of diasporas, which is the condition of the modern world, the area of globalization and trade, and thirdly, surprisingly, the election of President Obama. I want to say that there is a direct connection between the experience of Indian immigrants in the fields of Guyana and the election of President Obama. It might sound controversial, and I have to begin therefore with a caveat. As you've heard, I'm chairman of the CARICOM Composition Commission, and one of the first things I have to do whenever I give a speech is to say that I have taken an oath of office not to be controversial, because that's a quasi-judicial appointment. So if I say anything that's controversial, it's not the chairman of the Composition Commission speaking, it's probably the Dean of Law, because he's allowed to be controversial. So let's begin then with this debt that I say I owe to Guyana, and try to explain why I have that debt. And the debt is because a great deal of what I've done started right here in Guyana, in a very small building that was hot, dusty, uncomfortable, that was then known as the National Archives. I had come here in 1974 to research for that piece that was just read by Mr. Pizzai. I had come to write on Indian resistance. And you know, archives around the world have a reputation of being quiet, uh, silent, almost tomb-like places. This was perhaps the first archive of its kind in the world where outside I could hear people haggling about the price of fish or the price of gold or calling out to customers. So that was a kind of unique experience, probably the only archive of its kind in the world. I know you have moved on now to more salubrious and better surroundings. But while working in there, there was a big responsibility that I felt on my shoulders. Because sometimes, when you turn the pages of one of those documents, you knew that you were the last person who was going to read that document. Because the page could crumble in your own hands or could be destroyed given the humidity and given the, uh, the way in which papers in those days reacted to moisture and the atmosphere. So there was a big, big weight on one's shoulders that one had to tell the story. And what was the story I wanted to tell? It was a story not of what people had said about us, but we ourselves had made up for ourselves. It was the kind to of shift the emphasis from being the done to to being the doer from being those people who people wrote about to people who actually acted on their own. And so I was here in that, uh, that archive trying to fashion my own version of history. I reached there by a circuitous route. I had been to study in Jamaica and I was literally in the footsteps of another eminent Guyanese historian known as Walter Rudd, who had done so well in Jamaica that he was sent to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London to study African history. And he had done so overwhelmingly well there that when my turn came, I did not even have to apply to go to that school. My professor wrote a letter and I was accepted at source to study Indian history. So that's the second debt I had, a great debt to the path that was laid by uh, Walter Rudd. And finally, when I started to work on these archives, I realized that I could not do work on India, it was too far. So I began to do the next best thing, which was to study Indians overseas. And as it turns out, Indians overseas, the plantation Indians as we call them, were mainly sugar workers. So I started to work on sugar. And I did become, I think I still am, an honorary member of GAU. I worked on sugar workers, I worked on fields, I worked on commodities, and eventually, therefore, I became chairman of the sugar industry in Trinidad, chairman of the Sugar Association of the Caribbean, and moved on to work on trade and commodities, and now to work on the Competition Commission. All of that had to do with that, and all of that had to do with the debt that I say I want to do. So, from small beginnings and from a small world, we had far horizons to travel, and a world to make a little more smaller. The second thing I said I wanted to do was to try to explain how we fashion our own history. And how instead of having people write about us, we have to try to write about ourselves. Maybe I can start with an example, one of the earliest examples. And this comes from a log of a ship surgeon who came to Guyana aboard the very first ship. And he was writing about people 
He was writing about the people who were aboard the ship. And this is what he had to say. From his log, on Monday the 5th, the first day, he said, The men are all dressed uniformly in colored jackets and red caps, and are, with but a few exceptions, very handsome, well-formed fellows, and as happy and contented as possible. Now that's a good example of what people say about you. We don't really know how happy they were. We perhaps knew that they were good looking, but we don't know how happy that they were. That was Monday the 5th. By the time we come to Sunday 18th, happiness has disappeared. And this is what he wrote. On Tuesday morning of last week, we were sitting at breakfast. I was called out to see one of the coolies who had been suddenly taken ill and, as the interpreter said, in a very peculiar manner. But he fell down whilst walking on the deck. I went immediately and soon discovered to my horror and consternation that I was looking on a case of genuine Indian cholera and cholera in one of its most aggravated shapes. Then the surgeon's love goes on to describe the people and how they behave. And he talked about a woman, the mother, lying nearly in a state of insensibility with sunken cheeks and lusterless eyes, showing no sign of life, except as she occasionally opened her parched and burning mouth for a little water, and yet clasping an infant to that chill and almost pulseless bosom. And he describes the father sitting some place close to his wife and child. gave to a little child who was not yet four years old, medicine for the cholera. And as he says, the child took within the space of 16 hours the entire contents of a teacup full of strong rum. And he reports, she is now over her disease and is quite recovered. I won't go into the virtues of rum. I know how we have the most distinguished rum producer in the world in the audience. So he might have something more to say about it. So how do we move away from what people have written about us to how we try to write for ourselves? How do we escape what I call the tyranny of the text? How do we begin to create our own history? This is something I tried to do sitting there in the archives in Georgetown. And I did it in a paper that I wrote on Indian leadership in the Indian period, where I tried to describe that if we cannot write history from what people said or wrote, because the people we were interested in didn't really write, then we had to find another way to uncover the story. And this way was in what they did, if not what they wrote, because we didn't write. In what they did, in how they behaved, in what they built, in their song, in their dance, in the unconventional ways at that time that historians sought to find the story. That's what we try. Now this journey has gone pretty far. It has gone off in all kinds of directions. It started with something called the subaltern movement. That's a word from the Indian Army, and it means lieutenant. And what it said, students, is that if you want to find out what really happened, don't ask the general, because he might know. You have to ask the lieutenant. In other words, you have to ask the people who actually did it another person is writing afterwards about it. And that's why now we try to uncover meaning. So people look at what workers did, they look at what unconventional groups did, and now in the history of the Caribbean, in the next speech that you will get in the next occasion, they will look at what women did, at what the feminine uh, approach to history is all about. And while I say this, you will probably hear more about it next, next time, while I say this, the Institute of Gender Studies in Trinidad has just published a journal on the woman's view of indentiture. And you will find there how this approach now uncovers layers of meaning that we didn't think about. For example, there's an article about what it means to take part in a Mastana Bahar cultural show as a queen contestant. And how do images of beauty and of femininity and of sexuality come to be discovered, undermined, and reworked in a Caribbean context.
So there's a great deal more to learn about our past, more to learn about who we are. And we do this by trying to uncover history, by uncovering shades of me. And when I try to do this now, I make these connections that have not yet been made. I make a connection with the diaspora, the white diaspora, with the world condition of today, which is the mingling of diaspora. I make a connection with what the immigrants did in terms of bringing the Caribbean into the global economy, which is an ongoing project. And I make a connection, as I say, with the election of President Obama in America. So now, let me explain this truth. <coughs> if you ask yourself, what is the condition of the modern world today, in any great story that you read in any big newspaper, you will find uncovered there the mingling of diasporas, of groups meeting each other in new surroundings, of groups which have been scattered all over the world, meeting and mingling. This is what I call the mingling of diasporas. For most of us in the Caribbean, for some people in Ghana, it is well known, you can see it in Liberty Avenue in New York. This is where the diasporas meet and mingle. And when diasporas meet and mingle, new things happen things that you never thought about, things that demand creativity, that demand new approaches, that demand some kind of movement away from old and accustomed traditions, that demand some strength in those traditions, but some resilience and fortitude in going in a different direction. This is what diasporas do. So that when the Indian migrants came to the Caribbean, came here to Ghana, they were part of that stream of the mingling of diaspora, and they had to interact in new ways. That interaction is what the modern world is going through now. Because without going into great detail, you will find that some of the stories that uh, what people write and talk about now, some of the things that you've heard in the TV, in the newspapers, about diasporas mingling with each other, are stories that we have gone through here in the Caribbean and in Ghana already. So we have a great lesson to teach the rest of the world. For example, if you read in France a story about people dressing, about covering their hair, about the hijab, about going to school without a uniform, these are struggles that we have already faced in the Caribbean in our own time. If you read about the intersection between religious law and state law, about, for example, the age of consent, the age of marriage. These are stories that we have already faced here in the Caribbean in our own time. If you read about, story, about language problems, about how to have a curriculum that is alive to the cultural dimensions of the peoples of a particular locality, that is something that we have gone through already here in the Caribbean. So the general point then is that if the whole world is about the mingling of diasporas, if this is what is happening in every great metropolitan center in the world, from New York to London to Sydney now to countries in the eastern, to cities in the eastern part of the world, in Singapore, Bangkok, if you read about what happens in those places, it's the mingling of diasporas. And here in the Caribbean, we have already gone through. So we have something to teach the rest of the world. And how we mingled, how we created, and how we went off in new directions. This mingling of the diasporas, this contestation in culture, in law, in contestation in song, in dance, in how we behave and who we are. This is not something to downplay. This is part of our great history and part of what we can teach the rest of the world. So that a migrant in the cave field was doing something that he himself did not appreciate and now has become so important for the rest of the world. When diasporas mingle, not only do people mingle, but ideas mingle and ideas move. And there are great movements in world history that shows you how ideas move and things move when people move. Perhaps the greatest movements occurred between India and China itself and the, on the one of the previous speakers mentioned the growth of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and East Asia. One of the movements there was the movement of a great text called, in English, the Diamond Sutra, 
which is in fact the first printed work in history. It's not the Gothenburg Bible that we all know about from the 15th century, but this is a 9th century work, a translation of an Indian treatise printed in China, known as the Diamond Sutra, that tells you about new ideas in the world. Let me quote from that text. It says, and this is the 9th century, all composed things are like a dream, a phantom, a drop of dew, a flash of lightning. That is how to meditate on them. That is how to observe them. This book, students, you can find if you go on the British Library website and you can turn the page using your computer and feel this book. This is a transmigration of ideas, moving with people, moving as people. So we too, in coming here, brought new ideas and in leaving here and going to liberty in New York, are carrying new ideas and are part of that trade of the mingling of diaspora. This is an important contribution to world history and this is something that we ourselves are directly involved in. Now there are parts to this mingling of diaspora that you yourselves might have observed. Do you know how when people go to make a homeland in a new country, there are some things they are concerned about? And you see it in some of the TV shows that you watch. There's a particular TV channel that comes out of Canada, CTV. And there are three important advertisements that recur on that uh, TV. The first one is how to get food, the food that you are accustomed to, where you can find cultural or ethnic food. The second one is how to make sure that your children marry and marry properly. So there are all these advertisements for married sites. And the third one is how to send money home. What's the fastest and cheapest and best way to send money home? Remittances from abroad. This is a big important thing about diaspora living away. And so it is good for us here in the Caribbean how to remit the money from abroad. I remember a long time ago when Ghana was going through more difficult times, people said that we can talk about Ghana as a barrel society, as a society in which people lived on barrels which were shipped from abroad. That is the diaspora story. That's the mingling of diaspora. And that's the travel from one place to another and the connection yet to be maintained. Now, in this diaspora mingling that I'm talking about, there's a little problem that we face. We, who are part of what I would call the 19th century diaspora, that is those who came by boat. We came by ship and boat. And the problem that we face is that the tension is being placed in the modern world to the diaspora, not by boat, but by plane, those who come by plane. So if, for example, one picks up a newspaper to talk about Indians overseas, the attention will not be on the 19th century Indian who came by boat, but it will be on the new migrants to Australia or to the US or to England who arrived in the 1950s and 60s by plane. Little do they realize that the struggles they are now facing are the struggles that we who came by boat in the 19th century have gone through and have largely resolved how to live in a new society, how to deal with a new law, how to arrive at a new accommodation, how to be flexible and resilient. These are the struggles that we have on the road and we can indeed teach that new diaspora how to handle and to do some of those things. So that's this mingling of diaspora. The second thing I said I wanted to talk about was globalization and trade. And I wanted to make the point that the Indians who came here to Ghana had accomplished this enormous task of helping to anchor the Caribbean and Guyana into the nexus of world trade. This is a very important accomplishment, not often realized. It is the sugarcane worker in the field at one end of what's called a value chain. And the brokers and the sellers in London and elsewhere who sell the product, who trade it in the various markets of the world, there is a connection, a 
direct connection. And that connection is being replayed in the whole globalization trade initiative that we are living in. And indeed, it is because of that first wave of globalization that many Indians found themselves here in the Caribbean. <clears throat> I remember my own study at SOAS, where I went following the footsteps of Rodney. I was studying tax in India. And I discovered that one of the important things that happened in India was the introduction of the idea of property by the British. So that land, which before was like air and water used by everybody, suddenly became something to be owned. And because it was something to be owned, it came with a tax. And to pay the tax, you had to pay something like a portion of your produce. So that in Bengal and in Bihar, where a large proportion of Indians came, a tax system was put in place, which meant that the peasant at the bottom paid tax to somebody above him, and that person in turn paid to somebody above him, and that person in turn paid to somebody above him, until it reached the coffers of the government. So that in some places, there were over 150 intermediaries between the peasant at the bottom and the state at the top which accounted for the poverty, the unrelenting poverty that finally propelled many Indians to leave India and to come here to the Caribbean. That was tax. But the other one was trade. The people who came here came from a part of India which was, at the time, the granary of the world and the great storehouse of cotton and silk in the world. In fact, in 50 years, India would move from being the world's largest seller of finished cotton goods to the world's largest buyer of pure cotton. And I have to say, the shirt I'm wearing, I feel a little guilty about wearing it. Because I bought it two weeks ago in Washington. It was kind of dumped in a clothes basket. It cost 10 US dollars. It was very cheap, but it's 100% cotton. So I decided to buy it. But when I looked at the label, it's made in Bangladesh. And of course, you know the story. You know how factories in Bangladesh are dead traps. You know over a thousand people were killed in the collapse of the last factory. You know that the wages are abysmal. That's part of this global chain that I'm talking about. Between a dead person or a living person rescued after 16 days in a factory and the shirt that I'm wearing. That's the connection between globalization and trade. And the Indians who worked here, the immigrants in the cane fields, lived through that connection had a large part to play in that connection, a large part to play in the story of globalization and world trade. So that's the second big thing I wanted to talk about, to show how the immigrants who came here had a role to play in a grand movement of mankind. They talk a lot about ethnic conflicts, massive conflicts between the Africans and Indians. When you go into it much more carefully, and especially supported by the work of Rodney's uh, A History of the Guyanese Working Peoples, you will see that there's a lot more emphasis in the history on ethnic alliances between the Indians and the Africans than ethnic conflicts. There were conflicts, but not on the scale in which they were presented. And all that happened because we were looking at things from a particular perspective and not the people's perspective. There were a lot of points about the the, the taxes and why people came here, uh, the, the taxes were so disproportionate and inequitable that they created an unrelenting kind of poverty in India or Bihar and, and, and Bengal and forced a lot of people to remove themselves from those areas to come to these parts of the world. But I think a very important point is to do with the indentureship struggle and in a way Gandhi learned from the struggle in South Africa because they didn't have that kind of struggle in India at that time. And the removal of the British Rajas, Dr. Kusha Harak Singh spoke about, had a lot to do with the implantation, if you like, even with some modification, of the nature of the struggles in the colonial world, in this particular case, South Africa, to transplant into India. So I would like to thank Dr. Kusha Harak Singh for an extremely impressive uh, set of ideas that have been presented to us uh, and, and I think that these ideas will give us
a lot of thinking because sometimes in these kinds of discourses, we get a lot of regurgitation of history all the time. That is important, but you have to interpret that history, understand the sources from which they come, and how accurate they are. And so I like the style, I like what Dr. Kushar has done, learning history from the people's perspective. Just before we move to the next item, I want to acknowledge our next, uh, next week's uh, speaker, next week's presenter in our third and final lecture series, Ms. Mez Gayutra Bahadur, who is in the audience. And uh, if you can please stand so we can see you. She is uh, going to be doing. She's here a little earlier because she'll be engaging. She'll be engaging uh, uh, people in a number of writers' workshops in association with the Guyana Prize. So she has a lot of work to do between now and next Tuesday. So, Ms. Ms. Bahadur, we welcome you here. And I also want to, just before we get to the ads, I just want to say that uh, the, the archives that we have there uh, has already been named. The, the, the Dr. Walter Rodney National Archives, or perhaps they're not using the word doctor. The Walter Rodney National Archives. That is the name of Guyana's National Archives. So let me call now on Mr. Nias Van to take us through the plenary session. Mr. Nias Subhan, apart from his many works in drama, theater, and so on, he's also our distinguished director of the Guyana, of the Guyana Information Agency, GINA. Please give him a round of applause. say that we are much richer in our knowledge about certain aspects of what was discussed this afternoon following the presentation of the eminent Dr. Kusha Arak Singh. My job here is very simple and that is to facilitate any questions you have and I'm sure that you, you do have many questions so my job is to moderate so I want to um, open the floor immediately so we can have more time being made available for this interactive session. Last week we had a, a really good interactive session, and I'm sure that this week we will. So ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open. There is a microphone that is available that you can use to answer questions, so do feel free. that you may want to see. Yes, I'm sorry. Good evening, uh, Dr. Maxi. Thanks so much for that. Um, I have a question about what drew you to Guyana initially, um, and wonder if there was a difference between the conditions on the ground in Trinidad and Guyana that made uh, resistance among the sugar workers here It's very hard to make a comparison like that, like the one you are positing between uh, resistance in Guyana and resistance in Trinidad. People do make comparisons among the various um, Indian immigrant areas. I'll tell you a comparison that people do, that you uh, might have escaped you. There are people in Suriname who say, well, we are more Indian than the Indians in Guyana because we still speak Hindi. There are people in Guyana who say, well, we are more Indian than you Indians in Trinidad because you are too cruelized. There are people in Trinidad who say, well, we are more Indian than you Indians in Jamaica because you have forgotten all your names and customs and habits. So the comparisons depend on the frame of reference and the kind of scale that you are using. For my part, I wouldn't say that the resistance was any stronger in Guyana than but one of the things that does come out in the literature, and it's very well known, um, the accounts seem to suggest that if you were an Indian indented migrant, you would prefer to come to Ghana. 
But after your indentorship was over, you would prefer to go to Trinidad. And some of that had to do with ecological conditions. Um, even in Guyana, if you had finished your indenture, you might move from the swampier areas and you might move from Demerara to Burbis or whatever. Um, there are studies that show that people were stimulated by differing ecological zones, by where the mosquitoes spread more or less, by where water was more easily available. So there are different reasons why people might have changed. But I wouldn't say that the resistance was any stronger than one year. What drove me to come to Guyana, um, I didn't, it was, I was teaching in Trinidad, I'd been to the archives here, and I wanted to see the archives here. Yeah. I'm sure there must be questions that you want to ask. Um, feel free. Not very often we have someone, the caliber of Dr. Harak Singh, to come and talk to us. While we're waiting you, I, I'll probably have, I have two simple ones I want to ask. And uh, Dr. Singh, um, did your research in any way reveal or, uh, what the immigrants might have been saying on your own rather than what you said about basically something that was chronicled by other people? Did in any way your research may have revealed some of some of that? And um, from my own clarification, what could be some of the reasons in your opinion um, for the emphasis now uh, seemingly being placed on the diaspora that came by plane, as you mentioned in the 1950s and 1960s. Thank you. The, the first question, how do you uncover voice? Well, it takes you away from being a traditional historian and makes you more of an anthropologist. So that you look not only for written stuff, but you look how people move, how they dance, how they sing, uh, how they celebrate, how they fashion their buildings. For example, there's, there's an important book about mosques and temples in Guyana that describe how people build these structures with wood because that's what was available in Guyana. When, as you know, most temples in the world are built out of stone or marble. So you look at what people actually did. Um, there is a good illustration of this in what's described in India itself as the Bidesia tradition. Bidesi is a word that means the person who was gone, who was left. And one of the things that we don't often think about is having left in there, what might have been the impact on those who were left behind. In other words, what about the father or the wife whose husband left and came to the Caribbean, never to be seen again? How do you uncover those voices? Those voices are, in fact, replete in song and dance. There are poems about uh, women who write to say to their lover, why did you let me fall in love with you if you knew you were going to leave me behind and go away to the Caribbean? And those poems and songs, uh, some are quite erotic, but they are also full of longing and pining and uh, a notion of loss, of uh, not being able to reconnect again. So this is what people do as opposed to what they write down. And if I can take it to the modern world, you see it um, in a real, well, I'll give you an example of a real intense form of longing and separation and how one has to stay away, one can't afford to come back. And this is, if you think about a migrant from Guyana living in Liberty in New York, who is there illegally, he doesn't have his papers, so he can't come back home, and his father or mother has died, and there's a funeral, and he can't come. What you see now, what I have seen, is a funeral taking place by Skype, where he's connected in New York by Skype to the funeral celebration taking place here, and he can follow the rituals and, and follow what's happening behave and believe that he's actually here. So that is an illustration of what people do, and you have to tell their history then, not from what they write, but from what they read. Now the second question, why the diaspora of the 1950s has this great, um, this great attraction in the modern world? 
Some of it has to do with money. A lot of that diaspora is very rich. And the parts of India from which they came are very poor. So in fact, there was a great campaign of, um, of luring that money and that investment from this modern diaspora back to India. It's like uh, what Ireland tries to do with American Irish, or what now Greeks are trying to do with Greeks in Toronto. It's, that's one explanation, the economic factor. But there's another major factor, and this is that India has discovered the diaspora. Because India wants to have a seat in the Security Council of the United Nations, and also wants Hindi to be made a national a language of the United Nations. One way of doing that is to show that Hindi is spoken, like Chinese, which is a language of the world. Hindi is spoken in X number of countries. So all of a sudden then, these countries have been sort of discovered by Indian foreign policy. And that's another reason. Another big important reason, and we see it every day you go to the cinema, and that is that Bollywood has discovered the diaspora. The stories are about the diasporic Indian living in New York and having to arrange a marriage somewhere in India. How that clash of civilization eventually works out. Thank you very much. I recognize Mr. Evan Prasad. Dr. Harkson, um, in this article, control and resistance. Uh, I don't really see any mention of Martha Dumpus in Trinidad. You know, in Guyana we've had at least eight major shootings of sugar workers by the British colonial uh, authorities. A couple of them in which over 50 people have been shot. And um, is it possible that uh, the lack of these Martha Dumpus didn't lead to well, I like that connection because um, he's doing exactly what I did in my talk, trying to make long connections. But I'm not sure that the premise on which he started was correct because there were so-called martyrdoms in Trinidad. There was a very, very big event in 1884. It's called the Jose Riots. It's about the Mohara the celebration of that Muslim, well, some people say not really Muslim, the festival in India, in which uh, the Kajas were being taken into San Fernando. And in order to take them into San Fernando, one actually had to cut the telegraph lines. And the uh, British police at the time didn't want that to happen. So they blocked the crowd from going to the city. And the Indians, of course, insisted on going to the city. There was another very important reason, because that celebration Although it was a Muslim Indian celebration, it quickly become a multiracial celebration. Many of the free blacks were participating in that celebration. And the authorities did not want the show of unity. So they tried to stop that celebration from taking place. And it was stopped with bullets. There were 22 people killed in that particular martyrdom in uh, 1884. So there were these occasions of as to why uh, Guyana produced the Chedi Jagan and Trinidad did not, well, I will have to leave that story for someone else to tell because I may be a little biased. I perhaps learned a lot from Chedi Jagan. And one of the things I learned is how he was persevere. I remember him when his, in the days when he was not in power, coming to Trinidad. Very often he would stay around close to where I live and very often we have conversations on my veranda. One of the conversations was about debt forgiveness. And I used to tell him that this isn't an idea that I don't think it could fly. And he used to say it will fly. And he was right, I was wrong. Thank you. I recognize the young lady. 
uh, cannot avoid being connected to that world. The truth is, if you take five people in the world and put them to stand up at random against a wall, one of the five is going to be an Indian. And in the years to come, it might be one and a half or maybe two. Because as you know, the other most populous country in the world is China. Because of their one-child policy, the time will come when there will be more Indians than Chinese in the world. You probably also know that if you were to draw a map of the world in 1500, the center of gravity will not be New York, because New York did not exist then. It will either be Peking or Delhi, because that was the center of the world. And both China and India have this long-range view of globalization, where they are the center of the world. And they see the revolving world is coming back to that fulcrum where the center of the world will reside. If not only demographically, that is large numbers of people, but also economically and culturally. So we have to anchor ourselves a little bit in that movement and to be a part of it because we have an important role to play. Um, the second question, which um, escapes me for a moment, if you could just How you write history and how you create yourself? And how you recognize how your legacy, your heritage, and the role that plays in guiding your future. Yeah. Well, it's a, as you write, it's not a question, it's, like, it's a comment. I mean, we are what we are. People, anthropologists will tell you we are what we eat, because people are what they eat. And sometimes, you know, even in India, you have these great distinctions between people who eat rice and people who eat wheat. Therefore, people who come from North India and people who come from South India. Uh, you have a legacy that's uh, fashioned in many different ways. And you are, in a way, the baggage that you carry. Some of this you really can't escape. The trick is to try to turn that baggage to modern purposes. To try to make that legacy modern. And in a way, that's what I was trying to do in my talk. To show how, with our baggage, we can make a connection with the modern world. We can be versatile and flexible resolute and go forward. That's what I was trying to do and that's why I kind of mentioned that ancient text known as the Diamond Sutra because that's what the Chinese and the Indians were doing at that time. And it's very, very interesting. There is a, you know, if you go to an Indian ceremony, everybody's dressed in silk. Silk actually came from China into India. If you look at the Indian bride with the vermilion on the forehead, vermilion came from China. If you look at uh, Hindu religious ceremony where people are lighting camphor. Camphor came from China. If you are cooking and you put fennel in your food, fennel came from China. But they are now all quintessentially Indian. There is this uh, really, really famous poem about silk, about the Indian king going to battle under silk banner. And he's just left his queen in the palace and he's going to the battlefield. And the poem says, he himself is like a silk banner, moving forward but billowing behind because he's left his, his wife back at home. And his heart is going forward, his head is going forward, but his heart is going behind. That's a very ancient poem and it shows how long ago the silk route was opened, a route that was one of the major trading centers in the world, making and moving silk from the east to, to the west. The other major trade route in the world, as you know, was spice in the south of India. And India and China were connected to these two major routes. In the modern world, there will be important connections like that. And we all have to make sure that we find a way to be part of, to be part of that big connection. That's how gravity changes, how the center of the world changes. And we are quite lucky because we could be part of that center. Okay, I recognize Rupert Singh and then this young lady here. I see we have uh, quite a few students here. If you, you have a question, thank feel free. Thank you. Dr. Good evening, and thank you for being here. I have a question. Uh, on my way here, I was in discussion with my director, Mrs. Ben, and we were talking about uh, the Indians and how they may have lost their names, changed their names, and perhaps lose some sense of identity. Can you perhaps elaborate on that a 
Ch changing names seems like a simple try thing, but it's in fact a very, very important thing. It's, um, it's part of identity, and it's part of trying to discover who you are. And uh, the name changes actually are part of a great British tradition, because in the, Indian, in the British Indian Civil Service, there's a class of clerk or, or secretary whose name is actually writer. His job is to write. And it is the writers who fill out these long documents that end up in the archives in Guyana. And it is he, he who makes the name changes. Because he's trying to, in phonetic language, put a name down that is written in a different script. And so the name changes. Um, when I think about it, I have cousins. Many of you in the audience would have cousins. And me and my cousins do not have the same surname. Because I have my father's name, and they have their father's name. And although the two fathers are brothers, they do not have the same name. So you have this big problem of a nomenclature. Very often in the Caribbean, when there was a birth, the birth was registered by a clerk employed by the civil service. And that person was very often a non-Indian. That person had to give a name or write down the name. Very often too, there were people who, because of an old tradition, a tradition of not wanting to offend God, would not give a name to the newborn child because of infant mortality. You didn't want to feel that you were tempting God. So you would put off a naming ceremony. And that child would therefore be called baby. The child would grow to a teenager and be called baby. And the child would become a mother and be called baby. And the child would become a grandmother and still would be called baby. Or the child might be born on a day of the week and would be named as Sunday chair for Sunday or Budu for Wednesday. So there are different ways of naming. Um, and very interestingly enough, when I was introduced by Dr. Mizir, he called me Kush which actually is probably the correct version of my name. Because I had a twin brother, I was born as a twin, and we are named from the Ramayana story. And in the Ramayana, there are two sons of Rama, one is Love and one is Kush. So that's how I got my name. But somehow, in Trinidad, they became Kusha. And actually, my grandfather would call me Kush because he came from India. Everybody else would call me Kush because that's a shortened form of Kusha, but I am Kusha. So name change is an interesting thing. Luckily, my name is not Anthony. <laughs> that might be a little more straightforward. Thank you. 
what are your plans in um, documenting that? And also, um, have you thought of um, doing some additional research on the Indians who went to Africa, Fiji, Mauritius, and uh, other islands? With that in mind, I thank you so very much on behalf of everyone here in there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for those kind of words. There's just two things I would say. I mean, I understand the pain and the suffering, and that was why, in one way, I was making a connection with the election of President Obama. Because one of the things that he has done, and is doing today, even as we speak, the Senate Judiciary Committee on Migration is meeting, and what is in front of them is a draft bill to make legal many migrants who have gone and are illegal. The story came out yesterday, it's facing stiff opposition in the United States Senate. But if uh, President Obama has his way, then some of what I described in my talk as what made him possible might be repaid by a bill that makes it possible for those migrants who are illegally in America to become legal citizens. And that's the Senate Judiciary Committee on Migration meeting as we speak. Uh, on the second point, I have to tell you that I do have when I was in the Department of History, I did have a graduate student who was working on a PhD on Indian migration and liberty in New York. And that work is ongoing. So this is the kind of work that I personally will not do now, but my students are, are now doing. And this shows how the subject has developed and has moved into new fields that we never talked about. For example, and I'll just give you this illustration. My own student, one of my students, did a study called the Ramayan tradition in Trinidad. Now, you would think that you can't write this from the documents. And of course you can't. You have to go to the Ramayans yourself. You have to interview the pundits. You have to listen to their explorations and explanations. You have to look at their genius, which is to take one word and make a whole text for the whole evening. And to assemble all of that together and put it in a tradition that says, wherever the Ramayana has gone out of India, it has been recreated. Whether it's in Thailand or Burma or wherever, Sri Lanka, it has been recreated. And a new version of that story has come up. And in that new version, the history of the people is told. So for example, in the Caribbean, she says, the story of Sita is not the Sita of the ideal Ramayana as submissive as listening to her husband. But the story that comes out in the Caribbean is of the Orni with the Kaklas. It's a story of resistance and violence and of standing up for one's own rights. And that's how people remake their history and that's how it's retold. And I have to say in that uh, thesis that I'm talking about, the external examiner was Dr. Clem Sichara, who started off life as my graduate student before he went away to Warwick which, as we all know, I, I don't know if um, Yusuf Asad is here, now hosts a center for the study of Indian migration called the Yusuf Asad Center at Warwick, which is, a, of course, a big accomplishment. And in that, uh, in his report on this thesis, Professor Sicharan said, he never thought he would see the day when a PhD thesis in history from the University of the West Indies would have a chapter on the Ramayan Sumira, and when that art would be in existence. So that's how we move forward, and that's how we expand our horizon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll take one more question, and then we will uh, close this, uh, this session. I recognize teacher Raghu. Yes. What I heard many years ago, that some East Indians when they were about to come to Guyana, they had to, British Guyana, they had to change their names. I want to know how true that was and for what reason. I don't think that it is true that the Indians had to change their names. As I explained, the British kept records and the British were very good at that. I mean, there's a famous story about British history we said, that says, the government in Britain was a government sustained by files. They like to keep files. They kept files on everything. 
some people change that to say it was a government sustained by flies because you know you got these kinds of unsanitary conditions in some of these offices. But they, they kept names and when you look at the migrant records on the ship, you in fact see the names and the names are the original Indian names. Misspelled of course and sometimes truncated. The real problem was that British law required very often an Indian to have a first name called a Christian name and a surname. Sometimes the official forms here in the Caribbean said Christian name and surname. And so some Indians who did not have two names suddenly had two names. There are many Indians from South India who only have one name and suddenly they had to have two names. So some of it had to be made up. I mean even now when you uh, go to other places like Fiji or Mauritius, South India, and you see the names, in order to make sense of it, it would be a name like uh, Sami, and then there would be a designation S slash O, Mutusami. Sami, S dash O, Mutusami. And what that means is Sami, son of Mutusami. Because they don't have to know. So British kind of designation. They had to be given to them. It's not true that they had to change their name, but it is true that the names were changed in the act of transliteration, in writing down, or in conformity with rules here in the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a final question, but the Honorable Prime Minister wants to ask a question, so you'll be able to stay there. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn the beginning of the diaspora, the nearest diaspora, the nearest place of the world. And uh, people of Indian origin are certainly coming in. I think of the crash of the shuttle into Saipan, but I think uh, back in 2004, was in Colombia, here was the uh, lady who had been one of the astronauts who were born in India. That astronaut who died, her name was Kalpana, and she came from India. But um, it's also the case that the person who has the record for the longest time in space is also an Indian from America, and her name is Williams. <laughs> and she is a female, and she holds that particular record. A very short question, please. Another question. Um, Dr. Harak Singh, you mentioned that President Obama, a result of mingling. Right here in Guyana, we have President Donald Rabindranath Ramakar, who is the descendant of indigenous peoples who came here thousands of years ago. He's a descendant of African slaves, and he's a descendant of extended intelligence members. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll hand back the session to the chairperson, Dr. Prentiss here. Well, we've come to the end. I want you to give a round of applause to Dr. Kushar Singh, uh, eminent academic and dean of law at the University of the West Indies at Sintagosti. Thank you again, Dr. Kushar Singh. I now call on uh, Ms. Nadia, Ms. Nadia to do the appreciation and.